An American emergency exit sign, which was generously sent by Andy, who lives in the UK. And it's worth noting that this uh, has a red panel here, but it's also got these little chevron arrows that can be popped out to actually give it an arrow as well. And it's got this uh, plastic panel on it for daytime visibility. And then in the event of a power failure, it's illuminated. Well, it's illuminated all the time. In this instance, it's a maintained fixture. It's always illuminated by the red LEDs while it's charging. And then when the power fails, and I can actually show you what happens here because it lights up instantly, the LEDs in the bottom light up to uh, illuminate the sign, or keep it illuminated in this case. It's interesting to note that, you know, it's a very simple circuit. Uh, it just literally does illuminate. I've only got a couple of transistors here, some diodes and resistors. It's not as complicated as the traditional British ones, but it does have quite a few wires. There's a reason for that. So um, what can I say about this? It comes with this mounting hardware, so it can be mounted up to the ceiling. It's got little plastic bits that clip out, or it can be mounted in the wall. And I notice that the back of this also has the same clips the front has. And to open this up, there's no screws. You literally get a screwdriver and you have to sort of lever in here and just pop the cover off, which is reasonable enough. It's, it works very well. And it does light very evenly. It's a nice color. Inside we have a little transformer. We have the four wires. We've got white, black, orange and green. The green is bonded directly onto the metal transformer chassis. I think it's spot welded on. And the other wires are white is the common, or in the case of the UK it would be neutral. The black is 120 volts and the orange is 277 volts. And the reason for that is, well, this is known by everybody in America who deals with lighting. In America, they have multiple voltages for different applications. And while most houses have the uh, 220 volt supplies, they can uh, common for 220, 240 uh, by going across two phases. Uh, in industry and commercial applications, they have the 277 volt supply for lighting, just because it seems to be better suited to the task of things like ballasts, I'm guessing. So that's uh, why the transformer has those settings. And when you connect it up, you just connect the white to neutral and then choose 120 volt or 277 volt and you make sure you cap the other one up. And I'll show you that why I'm gonna let power this up right now. So let's bring in the flickery hoppy. And I shall just stuff a couple of wires. I'm not going to connect the earth wire because all it's doing is it's earthing the chassis of the transformer. So the white one, I have to remind myself because in Britain, black used to be neutral. Quite confusing, really. So here we've got the white is uh, neutral, black is live. Oh, no, let's not put black. That would be a bit dramatic. That's 240 volts put into it. Let's use the 277 volt setting. And I'm going to pop that in there. And... Keep this wire out of the way because this wire will actually become live. I'm going to power it up. Oh, let's uh, connect the battery first. That'd be good. That'd be a really good idea. So the battery's connected. It's lit instantly. And if I plug this in, it's showing a power consumption of... It's quite low. It's only about 1.6 watts. That might be partly because it's only 240 volt. Well, 245 instead of 277. Now, the reason I was uh, so... Uh, picky about the fact this has to be kept out of the way. If I bring a meter in and I connect it, turn it to AC volts, and I go between neutral and that wire, then you'll see that I'm getting about, let's uh, see if I can do this, it's a bit footer Let's see if I can actually get something realistic here. There we go, 101 volts, and that's because I'm feeding the 277 volt winding with 245 volts, so the 120 volt winding is actually giving out about just over 100 volts. And that works the other way. If you connected this fitting to a 120 volt supply and left the orange wire hanging out, it would become live at 277 volts. And I've told you about a horrible accident that happened at a fairground some time ago, but I'm going to repeat that story because it's worth mentioning. You see, this transformer is uh, designed for the two voltage, it's got a, a tapped winding. And if you connect the uh, neutral and the 120 volt, it will effectively com 
with reference to neutral, it will become live. This extra wine will come live at 277 volts, and that's exactly what happened in that accident. It was a maintenance guy working uh, on foreground rides, and he'd installed a new transformer in one of the cars, and it's it's one of the, a traditional sort of... I'm not sure what the name of the ride was, but it had lots of cars suspended, and they, it, they rotate around a platform. I'm not sure what sort of stuff it did. But they had halogen lights in them, so there was a transformer had burnt out, and he got another one. And the one that was supplied had loose wires hanging out at like this. And he connected, it was a 120 volt supply, the ride was not earth for some reason. So he connected it to the 120 volt supply but left this wire lying loose. And this effectively came live at the 277 volts. And it touched onto the metalwork. And when it did, enough current passed that it kind of spot welded itself onto the metalwork. And that resulted, people started getting electric shocks off the ride and they were wearing shoes, so they weren't too bad. It was a wet day that happened. Uh, and he went to check out the problem was to see why. And he knelt down on the wet ground, went to open the sort of chassis of the, the car that was giving electric shocks. And he was killed, unfortunately, um, because the whole chassis of that car was live at 277 volts with respect to ground because of that uh, auxiliary winding that hadn't been capped off. So if you connect these up, you must cap off the unused winding. It will effectively become live. Now I've got past that morbid story. Let's uh, take a look at the, the power supply here That when it's uh, lit off power. It's got a couple of AA-sized uh, NICAD batteries, 600 milliamp power. It doesn't have to be too high capacity, and that just plugs onto a connector here. The unit actually has a test button. It's got a little light to show it's on, and... Uh, a test button. When you press the test button in, it just simulates power failure and the light, the fitting switches to battery operation. The only way you could test it for long term uh, operation is to actually just turn the power off to it completely, which is pretty much what you do with UK ones as well, if they didn't have an automatic test function. There is rather pleasing a little connector from the transformer coming onto here. Three pins because it's a center tap transformer. Uh, zero at uh, 5.1 volt, 0 and 5.1 volt. So each of these red wires is 5.1 volts and the black one is a center tap. And if it means if you went across the two outer ones, you get about 10 volts. But in this case, that's not what they're doing. I can see already that they're using two diodes here. So I'm going to squeeze this little clip in and see if I can get the, the printed circuit board out. It's all designed for ease of manufacture. I'm gonna flex the circuit board up slightly and lift it out so we can take a look. This pack of hardware is the hang bracket and the metal plate. MD who works in the electrical industry in America will know this, but if you uh, live in Britain, it's all pretty novel. So what do we have here? We've got the two transistor circuit at the end for switching that on. We've got the incoming supply you know what, will I just reverse engineer this now? I will. Um, what, what can I do just uh, visually? The LEDs appear to be... They appear to have a resistor per LED. Not sure what all these diodes are for. Or the arrangement of the transistors. Oh, the transistors are in parallel. Right, okay, tell you what, I'm just going to pause momentarily. Well, I say momentarily, it sometimes takes a while to reverse engineer these. But I'm going to pause and I shall reverse engineer this and then we can take a look at the schematic together. Yeah, that was quite complicated to reverse engineer, not helped by the length of the circuit board. I did my usual thing that I print it out, but I had to actually, to make it readable, I had to print it out onto two sheets, uh, which made it quite a long and unwieldy thing to actually showing the video but uh, that that's pretty much what it is uh, but I've reverse engineered it and we'll, we'll break it down into the two parts of the circuitry the first is the power supply and it's using a very simple rectifier arrangement based on the fact it's a center tap winding the middle of the winding is effectively ground and to test it the test button all it's doing is breaking that connection and that basically kills the output so that then the thing comes on as the emergency mode Am I focused down okay here? I think I am. Yes, that's it. Focused now anyway. The incoming supply connects between either 0 volts and 124 or the 277 volt, depending on the supply. Goes through the transformer, you get the two 5 volt windings. 
But because of the way that it says 5.1 volt, but because of the way they're actually arranged here, uh, on each half wave, uh, each winding on each half wave, alternate half waves will push current through the diode. So what you actually end up is with a 5 volt supply across this capacitor with this symbolising this sort of 0 volt or ground on the secondary side. There is one other thing I've not included here, and it's a resistor between across one of the windings, which is quite odd. I thought they might have stuck this across the capacitor, but they've got an LED. Uh, what was the value of that resistor? It was 390 ohms, 390 ohms. And it's little red LED here on the side, and that's its little resistor tucked up there. I could have just read that there. So that covers the power supply. Very, very simple. They've just gone for a very cheap two-diode arrangement with this smoothing capacitor, and that pretty much there is the power supply. If we then look at the main circuit, it's actually quite interesting. To start off, if we ignore the stuff at the right-hand side, we've got roughly about 5 volts coming from the power supply. I've not tested it at its full voltage, so I'm not sure what its uh, actual full output is. Theoretically... Uh, if it was 5 volts, it would be roughly 5 times 1.4 equals 7 volts minus about a diode, perhaps. So let's say it's about 6-ish volts. So what actually happens is the supply in normal operation uh, goes through these two resistors. I'm not sure what they're for. It's almost like a, it's almost maybe they've uh, nudged the value of those to sort of pre-scale it, so to speak, and also to reduce the dissipation for the other components. So it goes through these two resistors here, 215 ohm. Then it goes through this chain of three diodes, and this is quite interesting. This diode here has a, the function that it's to prevent reverse current flow through, through the circuitry from the battery when the power's turned off, because if that happened, it could affect, if that wasn't there, it could effectively keep the unit turned off in the event of power failure. So that's what that's for. But then these other two diodes form a voltage reference related to all the LEDs down here. The LEDs are all on a common bus. Each has its own 22 ohm resistor. And there's about two volts across the LEDs plus the couple of diodes and the drop across the resistors. And it all adds up to just under four volts. And that means that if the nickel cadmium pack here, which will be about 2.4 volt under load, but when it's charged, it will go up to about 3 volts. It means that the when the power's there, it will limit the current. It will regulate the current depending on the voltage across the NICADs through this 33 ohm resistor. And if it's they're fully discharged, it'll be a fairly modest current. It'll be high-ish, not massively high. But as it comes up to the three volt end of, sort of charge state, there's only about one volt difference with a 33 ohm resistor. So I equals V over R. So that'd be one volt difference divided by the 33 ohms equals, it would only be about 30 milliamp trickle current to the nickel cadmium uh, cells. Now, something worth noting about nickel cadmiums, they're not like uh, lithium cells that you have to stop charging them and yet get to a specific voltage. You can keep trickling current through those because what actually happens is that the electrodes inside bubbles start forming at the end of the charge and they start venting off and the pressure inside increases. But the bubbles get reconverted internally with the chemistry back into the sort of liquid, the electrolyte that's in the cells. So it just continually cycles. And the only thing that happens is that the pressure increases slightly and you also get a very slight warmth off them depending on how much current's going through them. That same warmth is sometimes used. It used to be used in the old Ryobi battery packs to terminate the charge. It was basically a little bimetallic switch inside would click when the battery started heating up at the end of charge and it would then terminate the charge to them. There is a pair of transistors in parallel, PNP transistors, quite an odd arrangement. And they're normally held off by the supply that's coming and goes through this resistor here, which it's going through this resistor here, which is 560 ohms. 560 ohms, that's green for 5, blue for 6, and then brown for 1, which is 1 as a multiplier, so there's 1, 0. So that normally keeps that uh, transistor sort of pulled up, and that's also helped by the sort of the difference cr across these diodes. 
And when the power fails, so so when the power's there, it's uh, illuminating the LEDs at roughly just under about 20 milliamps each. It's also charging, trickle charging this uh, nickel cadmium cell, and it's also keeping this transistor off. When the power fails, the transistor's base then gets pulled to the negative rail by this 820 ohm resistor with a sort of decoupling capacitor across it. Not even sure why they've got that there. Hmm. But I suppose if there's... I don't know. No, I really don't know, because there's already a smoothing capacitor there. I'm not sure why they've got that. It's maybe just a little belt and braces thing. They've just added that little extra capacitor just because, well, because. So uh, what actually happens is that uh, when the power goes off, the because it's a PNP, when you pull the gate to the negative rail, the zero volt rail, uh, it uh, turns on. And when it does, the current then goes from the 2.4 volt nickel cadmiums through the uh, transistor, through the resistors, and the LEDs will light at anywhere between about 10 to 20 milliamps, depending on the voltage across that cell, that pair of uh, nickel cadmium cells. It's a very simple circuit. It's really simple compared to the British ones, because the British ones have that thing that if you connect the lead up, the battery, uh, I can do that right now. If you connect the battery to the typical British uh, emergency lights, they won't light. This one just lights instantly, and the point of that is that uh, if you're doing the installation, then what would happen with this one is that at the point you connect the battery and you close the box up, the thing would light up even though you hadn't supplied the main supply to it yet, and it would gradually run the LEDs down, and probably through the leakage through this transistor, the, the base current, it would fully discharge those cells. Not such a terrible issue if they're going to be, you know, the power is going to be turned on fairly soon. But in the UK, if I had plugged that on, they wouldn't have lit. But then when you turned the actual mains power onto them, then that's when they'd have lit. And equally, when you turned the power back off, they'd then remain lit because they were into the emergency lighting mode. So that's a, it's a very simple circuit. It works very well. The colour is nice. It's a sort of, what colour is that? What shade of red? That is about 600 and it's very warm. 640 nanometer. The duration state in the unit is approximately one and a half hours. That compares to three hours that we have in the UK for emergency lights. Technically speaking, if all the power went off to a building and the place was plunged into darkness, you'd expect to have it to be out, you know, typically within an hour. I suppose it depends on the venue. And the recharge time for this is stated as 16 hours. I don't know if that's a full recharge or just a partial recharge. But typically in the UK, the full recharge time would be 24 hours. So that's very nice. It's very neat. It looks smart. It's a nice bright uh, red display. It, uh, it looks quite attractive, particularly when you're used to our traditional British ones, which have the sort of either white illumination or sort of green LED illumination in some of them, but usually white with green graphics. And I suppose in a sense, the fact that red is one of the most robust colours means that this fixture, especially that simplicity, could actually be more reliable and lose its intensity over time less than the traditional British ones. So it's quite smart. So thanks, Andy, for sending that. That was really quite nice to take to bits and reverse engineer. Quite a smart little circuit.